cause we are earth to travel and good for the first Darkies in Tech, a community of ecosystem builders, is aiming to become a major role player in the global tech arena. They aim to do this by empowering black innovators in the ICT sector. For more on this, we are joined by Nsakum Kiba, the founder of Darkies in Tech. Nsako, pleasure to have you on the program this afternoon, man. Uh, firstly, tell us a bit more about how this uh, initiative was actually founded. Uh, how did the, the brainwave come about? Sure. Well, first of all, Ntanja, thank you so much for having me uh, today. It's a privilege to be here and to represent our community. Mm. Um, so Darkies in Tech is a story that started in February 2021, yeah. um, based out of a moment of frustration of just the lack of transformation in the tech space. Mm. So I'm a, find, a founder myself, and trying to build my business was very, very difficult. Um, trying to access spaces where certain you know, knowledge was being shared, where mm. networks were being formed, and where capital was, being, was flowing. Um, I usually found that when we did Our stories begin right here and we never write them alone. Sometimes we write them with someone who puts our story first. Other times with someone who puts their own story first. There'll be pages we love to read again and again. And some we'll barely remember. Sometimes we feel like the hero of our story. And other times, not. There are stories of dreamers, stories of creators, stories of strivers, stories of believers. And we're inspired by them all. That's why we invite you to write your story with us. Your story matters. Hi, my name is Charles OJ. I'm the CEO of Hyber, a Pan African innovation enterprise focused on delivering impact in, in Africa. And I'm really excited to, to be here and also I'm really excited about my colleagues that are you know, joining hands with me to, you know, on this journey. Um, my colleagues in Lagos, in Nigeria, in Kenya, in East Africa, um, in Johannesburg and also in, in Cape Town. And even outside the continent in London and Paris and, and the Netherlands. I would love to you know, talk to us about our purpose here in Hyber, and we're really very excited about using innovation to scale positive impact that brings real and lasting change for the African ecosystem. And as we look at Africa and seeing so many opportunities, uh, we do see lots of challenges. These challenges are, are difficult, they are intractable, uh, and our intent is to say, how do we bring prosperity uh, for all? And you may ask, how can we do this? And we do this in, in three ways, which we call our innovation missions um, around circular economy, um, inclusion, and also sustainable uh, lives. Let me just take some time now and just uh, talk about each of them. I mean, with the big uh, theme around climate change, uh, circular economy is something that we really, really uh, push and drive here at Hyber. And it's really about accelerating Africa's transition uh, towards adopting secular principles and actions which are relocalized, regenerative, and restorative by design. The next mission we look at is inclusion. And here we're really talking about not leaving anybody behind as, as Africa evolves into the development phase that it should be. And our mission here is to create opportunities that enable inclusive African societies for the benefit of many, especially women and youth. Uh, sustainable life is really around improving the quality of life, uh, whether it be education, whether it be health, uh, whether it be helping uh, for all Africans, uh, wherever uh, they may be. In bringing these missions to life, um, Hyber is offering diverse but integrated services. 
uh, these services are consolidated into three big buckets. Uh, the first one is uh, we show up as a venture builder, uh, where we work with scale-ups and small businesses to really scale their impact um, on the continent. Our second role or service is as an innovation partner. And here we work with large organizations like uh, multinationals, governments, academia, investors, or even development agencies to see how we can co-create solutions that can then uh, be scaled up um, in the marketplace. Uh, our third service is you know, looking at being a systems enabler where we solve you know, very complex and sophisticated problems um, in the market, uh, whether it be unemployment or even poverty. Um, how do we uh, collectively bring our resources and capabilities and design uh, using innovation and, if possible, uh, ventures to really transmit uh, solutions and impact uh, for the continent. So we're really excited about our work at Hyber and uh, we're looking forward to partnering with you and, and talking with you as we transmit uh, impact on the continent using innovation. Thank you. Well, good evening and welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, I'm not going to be here chatting too much because uh, you're not here to see uh, me or certainly see the things we are here to do. Uh, you're primarily here to uh, listen and learn uh, from our guest speaker, uh, Theo Mseka. So, Theo, thank you for taking the time. Theo joins us this evening all the way from KZN. Um, in KwaZulu Natal, as he prepares to deliver a keynote speech at an industry awards event this evening in Durban. So, really, we appreciate you making the time to 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 be here. And um, if, you, in case you are interested to know and you want to find out more about these sessions, uh, we do these sessions courtesy of uh, the Darkies in Tech community. So, thanks again uh, to Nsako and the and the community for participating and being involved. Um, so you can join us next week, where we will have one of the the the, the, the one of the fast growing up and coming uh, ventures uh, that's kind of growing, and again, I think a very interesting product for a lot of the darkies in tech community and general tech community in Africa, from a funding perspective, for you guys to come and enjoy uh, a peer masterclass session uh, with Vula, and you can learn more about Vula on Vula.vc, and you'll get to meet. The founding team uh, from Vula, and they'll also do uh, an exciting product um, demo for you, where you can see the product. And I know Theo is very familiar with the product as well, so I, I hope uh, you guys can do. Theo, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now, and you're welcome to share your screen. But as Theo does that, I want to encourage all the participants to please make use of the chat box. Uh, tell us your name. Uh, tell us where you're joining us from. And really throughout the session, this is a masterclass after all. So throughout the session, make uh, active use um, of, the, of the chat box function um, to share your thoughts, share some notes, share some, uh, you know, some thoughts and some questions that you might have. So throughout the session, the, what we have uh, um, um, discussed with Theo is that he, he is happy to stay a little longer till the end to allow those of you who want to interact and kind of uh, uh, speak to him directly to do so. But we we ask that you make use of the chat box for any questions. Myself and Relia are on the call uh, to monitor the chat box. And then Theo will kind of speak primarily around his life, his career, uh, his career highlights, and some of the, 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 the startup advice and principles that he believes in. Uh, I've known Theo a long time now, um, you know, almost going probably uh we're right chasing a decade more more or less right my brother so we, we're almost there and there but um and again i've always known theo to be an amazing guy so if he misses anything that he doesn't share with you guys be sure that i will tell you <laughs> some of those little things uh, and anecdotes he's always been a, a fun guy but, so theo, thanks again for taking the time to be here with us uh i'm personally also looking forward to just uh, sitting back and listen uh to the story um, yes, I know bits and pieces, but it's going to be nice to hear it, you know, uh, in long form uh, and, and hear how you uh, share it with us uh, with, in your own words. Over to you, Theo. 
Uh, thanks for the intro, Wu, and uh, thanks to everyone who's joined to hear a little bit about what I have to to share. I see a couple of uh, familiar names in the attendee list here, so good to see um, those of you that have joined. I appreciate you uh, being here to hear the story. Um, yeah, so, you know, the tech industry in, in SA and in Africa in general, you know, has evolved a lot over the years. Um, when I first got into technology, there was very, very few players um, doing what we do. Um, you know, the industry has become flooded now over time with many people um, taking to technology. I think a big wave coming in the late, uh, you know, from 2015, 2016 onwards. And of course, the COVID wave where everything went online and everyone and their auntie wanted to become a techie in one way or another. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting for me to see, have seen the changes that have happened and, um, you know, we, we, we're here with the darkies in tech, um, community. Um, and I'll tell you that for a very long time, I felt like I used to call myself the TBG, um, which meant the token black guy, because I'd walk into these rooms, um, and I was the only person of color. I remember going to a NASPERS conference in Berlin. And, you know, there was only two of us uh, there. The other black person was the technical engineer, like working, you know, the AV system. Um, and I was one of 300 people invited to go there. But yeah, okay. So the journey, you know, any journey has a beginning. Um, and for me to really tell the story very well, I need to be able to start from the very beginning. Um, I've tried to include a lot of stuff that, you know, may be relevant to some, irrelevant to others, but I think it'll be good to to go through that. So I can figure out how to do this. All right. So those are the things that I'm going to cover during the session today. Quick background, you know, studying. I had the um, opportunity to go to UCT, which I took for a short while, um, you know, the early years in tech starting my first company at 18, 19 years old, uh, second company at 20, 21, um, and then taking what I call as my first job uh, a few years later, and then international exposure, side hustles, you know, taking L's. Um, <laughs> we all go through that, um, you know, doing the abroad thing and then the reason for coming back home. Um, so that's what I'm going to cover. I'm going to fly through quite quickly because I actually love the interaction part of, of this. Um, and it's good to to hear some voices from, from you guys. So ultimately, I'll try to get through it quite quickly such that we have more time to be able to interact at the end. So background, um, because yeah, every story has to start from the very beginning. So for me, you know, I mentioned earlier, I was fortunate enough to go to UCT, but I was born to very, let's say, rural African parents. Um, you know, my mom had to walk 12 Ks with no shoes to go to high school. Um, and my dad had to do the same. Um, you know, they were fortunate enough to get scholarships and things like that. And then they were able to send me to very good um, schools. And I ended up at UCT where I fell in love with computers. I'd had exposure to the computers um, from earlier in my high school days, but at UCT is where I really fell in love with um, a computer studying electromechanical engineering initially. Um, and yeah, that's where I started my first company when I was 19 and ended up uh, dropping out of UCT, but more on that just now. So that's my family. It's a very old photo. Um, there's two members missing there, which is my sister's uh, daughters. But yeah, that's a close-knit family and, you know, a support structure. And as I said, fortunate enough to be able to go to great schooling. And ultimately, you know, at the point where I wanted to be able to quit school and do my own thing, uh, my parents supported me through that. Um, and I was lucky to, to have them. And, and have them contribute in such a positive manner to, to my upbringing and, and supporting my, my trajectory as I went through. Um, the very first computer that I owned, you know, the 386 Windows machine, uh, you know, it had a floppy drive, which some people on the call might not know what it is, <laughs> right? 
Um, but yeah, the use of that machine for me at those at that stage was largely to play play a game called Prince of Persia, which in comparison with some of the gaming today, um, you know, it really was uh, archaic. And you know, I'm a little embarrassed to say that that was my my beginnings to computing. Uh, that and the snake thing, um, by the way. And this was, you know, uh, Prince of Persia, the version I played was released in 92 um, and it was very 2D and you can see how jaggedy the edges are and things like that. I'm sure some of you on the call can probably build something like this within a few days these days. That's how advanced technology has gone. So early tech inspiration, my, my high school uh, physics teacher, um, doubled up as the computer lab administrator at the school that I went to, uh, Mr. Matatu. I always credit him with giving me the inspiration to understand um, computing, how computers worked. Um, he, he built, my mom was a dentist, and he built her patient's database, you know, management system, um, so she could move from using these patient's cards to having the cards on a computer to understand very quickly what was the last procedure done on this client six months ago, right? So I was curious how that system worked. And during the holidays, he would teach me how, you know, a record would be typed into the Windows form and then stored in the database in the background. Um, the whole thing was built in DBase 5. Um, and yeah, I learned a little bit about, you know, the interface and how to add a button and things like that. Um, when I was in high school, but, you know, in high school, you don't take anything seriously. Um, things really started to become uh, important to me computing-wise when I got to UCT. So I got to UCT and I found the first year for most of the things I was doing relatively easy. So I ended up um, spending a lot more time on the things I wanted to know, um, which was computing. But during my first year, I had a girlfriend who introduced me to her best friend's boyfriend, and uh, his name was Chris, who was studying botany. Uh, botany because he didn't want to work behind the desk. He wanted to be out in the field, um, you know, checking out vegetation and things like that. Uh, but Chris and another friend of ours called Pete, they used to have um, a small business called Packet where they sold computer parts to other students on campus. So if you needed a new graphics card or a keyboard, mouse, you'd buy it from these guys. And what ended up happening was um, one of their family friends needed their office network to be built. Um, it was an NGO. And ultimately, they needed help to, you know, lay the physical, um, you know, cat cable around that office. That's me and Chris, by the way, a long time ago. I hope I still look the same if I tilt my head like this and have that little smirk. You guys might think it might be the same guy. Um, so, yeah, during that time, I went to help them to build this office network, like wiring physical cable. And then the guy who was running that NGO said to us, hey, guys, I need a website. Um, do you guys know anything about this? And I'd taken one course um, during my electromechanical engineering days. And I said, well, if you give us a chance, maybe we can build you a website. Um, and ultimately that weekend jo job ended up uh, changing my trajectory and my interest. Um, and that was a big turning point in, in my life in general, not just my career. Um, because we started to, you know, where we started was <laughs> going to Google and that was a very early version of Google you see on the right there. And we Google, and we actually typed in how to build a website because you know we didn't know. Um, then we found tools like Dreamweaver, which we downloaded. Um, Microsoft SQL Server 2000 had just come out at that point. And you know, there was articles about it being a game changer. Um, classic ASP was the first language that you know Dreamweaver suggested people use. So that's what we ended up. I'm working on, which is really horrible when I think about it, but a lot learned lots of lessons about how to write clean code and 
you know, reusable code during those days. And everything that we did at that point, the only host, at least that we knew about in the country, was IS, uh, Internet Solutions, and we were in their data center in Cape Town. So we learned how to, you know, set up in, uh, server infrastructure. Those early days, it was really interesting because to do a release, you had to copy paste files onto the live server. And to do that, um, we'd have to take, um, you know, our, our files and we would go straight to that data center. Uh, we had one little small rack inside of it. And, you know, Google had a whole, <laughs> had, had a whole row uh, behind us. But yeah, we're in the same data center, some of the giants. It was super early. Not, not many businesses had uh, that kind of infrastructure those days. And we'd have to manually paste files over, you know, the live environment. Very, very dirty way of coding, dirty way of deploying. But that's what we're forced to do in those days. Um, yeah, so we had to physically drive to the data center to do a release. Um, and then copy paste files onto the live system. Um, but that mean, meant you have to have had proper tests and ensure that everything worked 100% before you went and just stuck it live. So that was the first kind of phases of developing and releasing. Um, and yeah, for that NGO website, I think it took us five to six months to build that. Um, we were paid 5,000 Rand back then. And for us, you know, 19 years old students, and back then, I think it was 2000, 2001, um, it would cost 45 Rand to fill my Mazda uh, 323, and we got 5,000 Rand. So we're like, hey, you know, this is, a, <laughs> this is a big thing. Why are we at school again? Let's go and build websites for people that want them. So we registered a company, and that's our first logo on the right-hand side there. It was called Go Media. Um, yeah, and that website that took six months to do, um, today it would take someone less than a week, maybe even, you know, one Saturday, someone could build that. Um, but technology has come a long way in the last 20 odd years. Um, so yeah, we created a uh, go media and I, at that point, um, you know, halfway through my second year at UCT, I decided to drop out and focus on building that business. Um, we worked from a garage in, in Hart Bay where we lived for the first two or three years. Um, but then we started subletting from a real estate agency that had a, a space in their office. And we took the little corner room, which you can see on the bottom uh, left there. That room was literally two meters by three meters long. And we operated from that space for, for a long time. Um, uh, being the two-man team that we were. I think this was photos were a little bit later on because I'm seeing a laptop there, uh, probably around 2005, 2006. Uh, but you can see me on the right there, still using the, <laughs> the desktop and the massive screen, which was a big mission when I had to go home because, you know, I didn't want to leave stuff at work. I wanted to work consistently all the time. So I'd have to carry those things with me. And, and take it home every day. Uh, massive mission um, uh, back then. So it wasn't as easy as throwing your laptop into your backpack and, and going home as most people do now. But yeah, so from there, we started to build websites for um, anyone and anyone and, and everyone that needed them. You know, usually it was the small art gallery here and the doctor there, that kind of uh, thing. It was hard for us to, to get work and build traction, um, but we persevered because we were young and hungry and would work overnight, you know, and try and get things done very quickly. Um, and at some point we were one of the biggest hosts, at least in the Western Cape. Um, we built up to over 700 clients, um, hosting different, you know, emails and, whatever else for them, but um, their web solutions and, and intranet solutions too. Um, something that has always stuck with me from when I was really young, I think it was 11 years old, where I was preparing, you know, going to final year of junior school, um, about to go to high school. My mom always said to be as busy as an ant. 
Um, and that always stuck with me uh, because, you know, what she really meant was you'll never see an ant just sitting, basking in the sun, catching a tan. It's always on the move, um, you know, finding the next thing that it needs to take back to the hive. And ants are usually carrying, um, you know, like crumbs or whatever it is that they're carrying, but it usually weighs multiple times the ant's weight. So just meaning punch above your weight and, and continue to be busy, always move, uh, never stop. And, and that always stuck with me. So three years into forming our first company, we built our second company called My Agent, which was a real estate valuation system. I couldn't find screenshots of this solution, so I found a brochure, which I've included here on the right-hand side. But yeah, my agent, it was one of South Africa's first mapping solutions uh, built on the OGC, which is the OpenGIS Consortium spe Specs. And it was, you know, those days Google didn't exist. Google Maps didn't exist. Um, I think we launched six months or eight months before Google um, had mapping. Um, so it was very archaic. We had to learn ActionScript and we had to use that Flash client. Um, that was the best way we could think of doing it back then. Um, and yeah, my agent was my first entry into real estate um, and piqued a lot of curiosity for, for, for me around real estate. Um, and ultimately, I think this project that we did, which was our second company we built together with my former business partner, um, was the turning point, another turning point in my career, um, ultimately because we stumbled onto something that ended up being um, one of the best solutions or first solutions in South Africa at that stage. So, you know, we had a valuation model that was quite primitive. Um, you could zoom in the map, click on a land parcel, and it would tell you what the municipal value was. You'd click a button and it would generate um, you know, we didn't have, <laughs> we couldn't write AI models back then to help predict future pricing and things like that. So we we did our best and it was quite primitive, as I say, what we had, um, but it worked. And we went to talk with the city of Cape Town and they loved it and they wanted to use this tool that we had created internally. Um, and we're getting quite a lot of buzz at the time. And what happened was we caught the attention of a company called Corby Tech. They had the biggest um, title deed search tool at the time called Windeed. And, you know, we're starting to eat their market share um, just in the Western Cape because at that point we're only in the Western Cape. So we were trying to talk with these guys and create a solution whereby they would give us the data for the rest of the country because we only had Western Cape covered. And at that point, you know, I think within six months of negotiations with them, um, the deeds office increased their price from 50 cents a record to six rand something a record. So it was a more than a thousand percent increase on their price um, in one increase round. Um, and that essentially meant that we couldn't compete for, the, for this segment anymore. Um, because in South Africa, there were, at that point, there was four and a half million um, title deed records at the deeds office, um, or nine and a half million, sorry, nine and a half million title deed records. And, you know, at 50 cents a record, it was four and a half million rand to buy that. But when they put their price up to six rand something, um, it became impossible for a small company as ours to try and get that data. So at that point, we doubled down to try to talk with Corby Tech to say, hey guys, the deeds office pricing is ridiculous. We want to partner with you rather. Why don't you give us the data and we'll build the technology? Um, at that point, uh, the MD, Rian Basson said, look, guys, we see what you're doing. Um, we have a bigger play where we want to get Property24 from NASPERS. And, you know, ultimately, if we can't do that deal with Property24, then we'll back you guys because we had a really small portal um, on top of my agent where people could advertise properties. So ultimately, you know, that ended up leading to a few years later because everything took long back then, um, longer than it does now. 
um, that ended up leading to, um, oh yeah, okay. So, uh, you know, here I was saying basically, you know, if it's not hard, you're not dreaming big enough. Uh, what I mean by that is some of the things that we had to do back then uh, were seemingly impossible given where technology was at the time. Um, and I see a lot of, you know, startups today where people are trying to build um, technology for the future. And, you know, it's cutting edge stuff that we're seeing. And I think most dreamers are the ones that are going to cut through in the future because they're, they're dreaming big. Um, just to go and build something that is, you know, uh, search 2.0 or another way of, or a niche of a specific thing that already exists. I mean, you can build a business that way, but I think you have to kind of try and push the boundaries and do things very differently. Um, which is what I think in the early days um, we managed to do. And it's a lot harder now, right? Because it's more saturated. Anything that you think of has probably been tried or done. Um, so you have to build tech differently to be able to cut through. So Go Media, okay. Um, credibility. This is an interesting kind of uh, segue because we were a very small company, a two man team. Eventually we grew. Um, from there, but we started to get traction through my hobby at the time. So at the time I was doing this thing called salsa dancing on the weekends. So I was part of a dance group and, uh, you know, I got pretty good at it. Um, around 2008, I started traveling to, uh, different parts of the world to partake in these salsa exhibitions. And, you know, my early dance group, which is, let's say, the photo in the middle, um, like, it's incredible because when I look at that photo, I sometimes wonder how lucky I was to have such a hobby. Um, you know, the guy on the bottom left, let's say, yeah, his name's Ryan Hill. He's the head of Universal Music Publishing, biggest guy in music in Africa. And he signed Burner Boy, for example. But we met you know, on the dance floor, like doing something that we loved on the weekend. Um, and I mean, I can mention a bit about the others, but for the sake of time, I'll skip. Um, but the idea that I got at that stage was I was traveling to, you know, Germany or Croatia or New York to go and dance. Um, and while I was there, I tried and find, you know, agencies that were outsourcing work to India. Um, and so we managed to find a German agency that would give us a chance. Uh, the time difference between us and Germany was um, small enough, like an hour in the winter and the same time in the summer. Um, and so they'd outsourced to an Indian company um, for a project which they'd given them six months to do. So we said, okay, give us the same brief that you provided that business and we'll do the work pro bono on the side and then you guys can compare the quality of the product at the end. Um, and because we want to, we want you guys to give us um, some of your work um, in the future. So we took on this project a few weeks after um, it had been briefed to another company. We delivered within two and a half months. It was a six months kind of project. We delivered within two and a half months and then they had to wait for the other company to deliver their side. And when they compared the end product at the end of the day, um, they would have chosen ours. So from that point onwards, we started getting um, work out of this German agency and others like them because we now had a portfolio of international work we could showcase when we wanted to go to pitch to the next agency um, somewhere else in Europe. And all of that was made possible because you know, I would go for two weekends in a row. The first weekend would be in Hamburg, Germany. The next weekend in um, let's say in London. And in that week, I had five days where I'd be working remotely, but just doing my own thing. And then eventually I thought, no, wait a minute, let's use this time to try and get, you know, earn euros living in South Africa. And, and that's what made, um, made us end up going to do these pitches at the agencies. But if it wasn't for salsa dancing, I wouldn't have been there in the first place, you know? So, the, my hobby ended up building indirectly credibility for our, our business. Um, 
And yeah, so the German agency we worked for, we started to get bigger and bigger projects as we went on. Um, I mentioned about the pitch and the risk project that we took on, but yeah, our company ended up building so many different projects. Um, like we built the World Cup 2010 ticketing engine, which again was a big challenge um, because it was the first project that I you know, had experience in building a website that needed to be in 18 languages. And some of them were hard, like, you know, Chinese, Russian. Um, those are hard languages because you need to have the Cyrillic and the Latin. You know, it ends up being two languages you have to cater for, um, for the one. And also multi-currency support um, for, for, for a platform. Um, uh, it was the biggest project at that stage that I'd been a part of. Um, and, and yeah, it's one of the things I'm proudest of um, in my career. Uh, but again, if it wasn't for going to the German agency, we would never have been considered for those kinds of projects. Um, and the engine that we built for this ended up being used for the cricket 2011 and the rugby 2011 as well, the World Cups for those. It was a really robust engine um uh, the way that we had built it and some other clients we ended up doing while well, was to the go media was you know we built something for total which was an oil spill response system that they used mainly in west africa you know angola um, upwards um we built investex first public facing website for private wealth clients um knightsbridge which is responsible for i'd say 90 percent of you know, guest house bookings in South Africa, that engine um, we built in 2008, 2009. And my former partner and, and you know, that business, they're still kind of maintaining that product, um, you know, 15, 16 years later. So that small business that we started in a garage and had a two by three meter office uh, ended up supporting over 700 clients, 800 projects, and we grew to a 15-man team that did websites such as the World Cup, um, we, a website for South African World Cup soccer. Um, and we are with the, I think we're the first, well, one of the first companies in South Africa to adopt Scrum methodology, which I think is, um, you know, um, most people in technology would utilize either you know, a version of Scrum or their own version of Scrum or some sort of Kanban, but we're the first um, to do this. And I took that to Corby Tech where I got my first, what I call my first job. So coming back to the story of negotiating with Corby Tech to try and get data for the deeds office, um, I think it was two and a half years later, they finally did the deal with NASPERS where they bought Property24 from NASPERS and then NASPERS bought them a controlling stake in them. And then, you know, this was a time before big businesses believed in remote work. So the Property24 team was based in Randburg and Joburg at the time, and Corby Tech's headquarters was Newlands and Cape Town. So they offered people to move to Cape Town and only one person wanted to move. So they had to rebuild the entire team. Um, at that point, the MD remembered, hey, there are these kids that have built a real estate system that we wanted to buy if this deal didn't work out. So they called me and said, would you be interested in coming and running Property24? So at the time, you know, it was a difficult thing because we were in the process of building the World Cup uh, website. We hadn't finished that. And, you know, I'd gotten this offer to go to NASPERS, which is one of the biggest investors in technology um, globally. And it was a really big decision for me to make at the time. So I said to them, look, guys, I'm working on the World Cup, uh, you know, ticketing website. And when I'm done with that, then I'll be happy to come and see what you guys are doing. Um, and by the way, that ticketing website, if I just go back, um, <laughs> that was very scary. I don't know if some of you would have watched, um, you know, Seth Blatter, the, the president of FIFA at the time. Um, you know, they picked the names out of, you know, say out of a hat. It's not a hat, but I don't remember what it is, right? So they picked the names of the countries to say what pool they're in. 
Um, and they do that. It was 20 teams or 30 teams. I can't remember the number. But from them finishing the last, uh, allocating a pool to the last team to our website going live was four minutes, right? So because as they're pulling out the name South Africa Pool B, we had to, like, in our back end, be putting South Africa into the right pool. Um, and as the, we finished doing that, we clicked generate the um, the games because we knew that, okay, pool B, team two plays team one in the first game, etc. So we had to put the names in the right sequence, and then we generated everything. And within we were live within four minutes of them uh, pulling out the the names from the background from the from the uh, allocating the pools and within seven minutes of that we got the first order of forty thousand dollars on like the hospitality packages um so the kind of pressure that we were under uh in the back of that uh kind of room where the, all the stuff was happening was huge uh i've never had such pressure in my life because i knew the world is trying to book these tickets and within seven minutes of forty thousand dollar purchase happened um so super high 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 uh pressure and the amount of traffic that website got the recording stopped uh, um uh, Vu, if you can do something in the background i'm going to continue though perfect <laughs> recording in progress okay so the kind of pressure that we were under um was was immense because the world was watching and everyone wanted to get tickets for that uh, World Cup. But what we built was bulletproof. It never went down. Thank you, back now. Thank you. Yeah, what we built was bulletproof. It never went down and continued to, to, to work, which is why it was such a great project. So after we had finished that project, then I spoke to the guys at uh, Corby Tech and said, okay, I'm ready to now, you know, because everything we had done up until then I was learning and doing, and I knew that Naspers had a lot of very smart minds and I would learn a lot um, by joining them. Um, and also I was looking to get like more international experience. Um, so I ended up selling my shares in that first company and the second company to my former partner. And I went to join Property24, which was my first uh, job. So that was November two, 2009. Um, I ended up joining them and yeah, I was number three on the team. Um, so remember I mentioned that no one wanted to move to Cape Town back then. Um, and as a result that to rebuild the entire, the entire team. So I joined as the head of product, chief product officer, but I did a lot more than that, um, in the beginning. And yeah, it was a journey this, um, because property 24 was, was a little bit weak back then. So I'll explain why here. So Property24 was half the size, the red line is private property. Um, property24 was half the size of private property when I joined. And you can see this, this shop, and this is maybe August 2010 was a year, nine months after I joined, 10 months after I joined. But from there, it starts to climb and go up and to the right. Um, you know, I leveraged a lot of the experience I got from the Go Media days, building websites for art galleries, the FIFA World Cup website, the search engine optimization, all of that stuff. So it might seem like you've got a relevant experience in some niches that, you know, maybe don't matter towards the role you're doing, but you can leverage your experience to be able to bring it all together and, and literally build a monster. Um, because that's what uh, Property24 is today. Um, it kept rising to the top from being half the size of number one at the time to being, I don't know, four or five times the size today. Um, but it all happened very, very quickly uh, back then. Um, it took two years to become number one in South Africa. So what ended up happening? Three years after I joined, we ended up you know, taking that platform international. Um, we've created a business called Domo Fund in Russia. Um, you know, it was a partnership with one of the big classified businesses that uh, NASP was owned in Russia. And we went from, you know, 
essentially it took 14 months to be number one in Russia from zero traffic. Um, and I would have to travel there, which I made a few mistakes in the early days of going there, but I'd have to travel to Russia two or three times a year and spend two weeks. Uh, note to anyone who wants to go to Russia, it's a really beautiful place and it's visa free for South African passport holders. Just don't go in winter. Um, you know, minus 30 degrees, minus 25 degrees. It's, it's not fun. Um, but the summertime is beautiful and Moscow is one of the greatest cities I've, I've had the pleasure of visiting. Um, but the property 24 engine, we ended up creating, um, you know, different versions of it. And so we launched in Philippines, Kenya, Nigeria, 17 other countries. Uh, but the Russian project was the most exciting one uh, because of the scale of Russia. Um, so again, this is screenshots from SimilarWeb back then. Um, you can see on the top right, we launched in September of 2014 um, from zero traffic. The biggest in the country at the time was Xi'an. And it took us 14 months from launching to being number one, um, zero traffic to seven and a half million unique users per month um, in 13, 14 months, which is massive. Um, what I learned from that is that you can have a good engine and that engine can work in, a, in another market um, if you execute well. And, you know, South African platforms are very exportable. Um, there's lots of great tech built in South Africa that does well internationally. Um, it's all about the international execution. So product development is one thing, but product marketing is also important. And I think the marketing job um, that we did in collaboration with the Russian team, that was really, really powerful. Um, and, and that's what drove this growth largely. So, you know, it's not just about building something. You need to also get people there. Um, and, and these days, it's gotten a lot easier to be able to drive traffic and engagement um, on, on digital platforms. So another thing is, can a, you know, can a good business model and technology engines work across verticals? Because it's easy to say, yeah, okay, you took the property 24 platform, you added the Russian language and the Russian listings and you ran, um, because you understand the niche. It's easy. Um, you know, so we got a challenge in 2015 where, Again, Nespers bought Autotrader. Autotrader was half the size of the biggest player in the market at the time. And we took that platform and we forked the Property24 code base um, and we removed bedrooms and bathrooms and square meterage of the garden. And we added make model transmission type and color of the car. And we, we rebuilt Autotrader. I think it took 11 months um, to rebuild the, the you know, back end, front end, billing model, everything. Um, and yeah, Autotrader today is more than double the size of the next player in, 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 the, in the market. Um, so again, another proud project because um, it was the first in a long time, having worked in real estate specifically for a long time, it was the first dive into something outside of real estate for me. Um, and yeah, you know, having worked on two of South Africa's top 10 internet destinations, um, I, I, yeah, for me, that's a, a proud thing because there's not many people that can, you know, say they've worked at one of the top 10 um, internet destinations for the country. Um, you let alone be responsible for building them. But again, leveraging experience from early experience from Go Media, um, um, that's what helped to be able to, to do this. So when you look at these two platforms today, you know, you always look at them independently, but I did this side by side just so people can actually see the similarity between them. Um, you know, it's pretty much the same platform, just little nuances. Um, that's Autotrader on the right and P24 on the left. So ultimately, um, you know, you can take something that's working and pivot it for something else. And you can be as blatant as launching the same colors and branding. Um, because once you have a formula that works, 
you can execute it in multiple um, niches. And, and that's exactly what happened. And people, I suppose, the affinity that people have with Property24, it being the older, more established brand, that may be transferred without them understanding why they love Autotrader um, to Autotrader, you know. Um, and, yeah, it's one of, you know, the top 10 used tools in the country now um, as a result of that strategy. Um, okay, so side hustles. Um, Vu will know this <laughs> very well because, uh, you know, we've known each other a long time. I've tried many things in the past and I've taken many L's. Um, so for me, L's, I don't mean lo losses because, yes, uh, many failures, but I see them as lessons. Um, ultimately, just highlighting some of the things here, but there's many others um, that have happened. I think it was 2014, 2015, before Auto Trader happened. Um, at some point, I decided that I, I was spending a lot of time watching sport um, online, or not online, but on DSTV at the time. So on a weekend, you know, I was an Arsenal fan. I'd watch Arsenal play whoever. Then because Arsenal's rivals were Man United and whoever else, I'd watch two other games and then i was also a rugby guy so i'd watch the stormers because i lived in cape town i loved the hurricanes and i loved the crusaders so i'd watch those three rugby games and then at some point i thought rather than doing that if i'm going to watch sport let me do it live but let me take that 10 hours on a weekend and let me let me build something so uh, myself and a friend we built a business called tenons um which is what you see on the screenshot on the right-hand side. Tenons ended up being, you know, number two in South Africa for wine delivery. And it was a weekend and night project um, run by two guys that did both, both of us did other things. Um, at some point we hired an admin person to handle the wines. And the hardest part about this was keeping the inventory um, up to date. Uh, because the vintages change twice a year in February and July. So we would get our, our friends that we knew and would hire students. And uh, yeah, I forgot to put those pictures in, but I, I would have a table or tables with 20 people for three days in my house, um, just updating, you know, the imagery and the details around, you know, the single 2014 single block, Chen and Blanc becoming a 2015 um, you know, and you have to change the bottle and everything with it. But super early days for, for wine, specifically online. And if you look at that design, that's from 2014. Um, and, and I think it's still fresh compared to some of the platforms you would see today. Um, we ran that for four or five years. When I moved to Turkey, my business partner for that venture didn't want to continue with it. So we shut it down. Um, other things tried... Uh, Ticket World was, you know, I was doing events at the time, uh, All Out Salsa Festival, which is the big one. But I built something called Ticket World, um, which I thought I would compete with CompuTicket for with at the time. Um, you know, today there's five, six different ticketing platforms. Um, back then there was only CompuTicket and I thought the user experience of it was horrible. So Ticket World actually was working quite well. Um, why didn't it work? It didn't work because I had a job. <laughs> and I didn't have marketing money to compete with CompuTicket, um, ultimately. But the lesson there was, if you've got something that's working, double down on it. You know, Don't be afraid to um, go out there and seek funding and jump into it. Because if I'd done that back then, I think you know, it could have been the biggest ticketing platform not just in South Africa, but probably for Africa. Um, uh, maybe another one I can mention is Fanya Kazi. Fanya Kazi was a micro jobs platform um, early on, also around 2015. Um, the concept there was to get service providers to register and then people could book based on reviews. Um, you know, so yeah, businesses such like Sweep South and Domestly and uh, whoever else has come along after the fact, 
Um, I think those guys have done well. Um, and, you know, I'd identified that niche very early on and, and built a trial version of it. Um, but again, I, at that point I was enjoying, you know, the Russian project and auto trader, and I didn't want to quit my job to go and run these side, side projects. Um, but those are all things that I think, you know, as entrepreneurs, we shouldn't be afraid to try. We have the, the skill set to be able to build stuff. You can try it and actually you can get traction very easily. It's become easier over time to, to launch a business. You could decide on something today. Your website could be live by Sunday because the platforms allow you to build template based, you know, websites to in this day and age. So it's become a lot easier than back then to be able to build a product. It's just about your mentality and jumping. Um, you know, if you put your mind towards it, you can do it. Um, the others I'll skip, I think, in the interest of time. Yeah, so 2018 came along. I took what I call my second job. Um, what happened was the business that we launched in Russia called Domofond, um, you know, from earlier on, we launched from nothing, zero to seven and a half million unique users, becoming number one in traffic in Russia. And what happened was there was a Turkish business that owned the number four player that became number five player after we launched. They looked at that and said, Oof, who are these South African guys that have just launched and overnight come and you know, um, win the Russian market? And ultimately they wanted someone from that team to go and do the same thing in Russia and Turkey. So they approached me and I took my second job. I moved to Turkey. Um, big challenges there, you know, adjusting to a different culture, different religion, uh, different language. Um, but I moved anyway. And yeah, there were lots of challenges. Um, so language barrier being the biggest one. Um, you know, the business had 250 people, but less than 10% of the staff understood English. So I was forced to learn Turkish, um, which took me about two, two and a half years to learn. Um, by the time, you know, I was leaving, I was quite proficient in it. I took it very seriously um, to learn the language because, you know, as the CEO, I can't stand and give a speech to 250 people in English when they don't understand it. You need to be able to greet everyone in the morning as you walk past otherwise you know what kind of leader are you if you can't communicate with your team um but yeah that was very difficult turkish is a hard language to learn um and you know if it was a, like spanish or something i would have probably learned it a lot faster um and also continued with it after leaving because you know spanish is spoken in a lot more countries turkish is only spoken in turkey so, you know, it's not a language you would that you'd get use of um, outside of being in Turkey. Um, there was lots of pressure on my family um, at the time because, yeah, difficult moving, being far from family support structures, etc. And then Turkey itself was a tough country to move to because of its economic and political challenges that they had. For context, when I moved there, you know, one... US dollar would give you 3.25 Turkish liras. By the time I left, it was one US dollar gives you 30 or 33 Turkish liras. So they, you know, the Turkish lira, yeah, it got decimated in four years. It, it literally lost a thousand percent value. Um, and we're living in times of 120 percent inflation. Um, you know, interest rates, crazy, 23, 28% interest. So in South Africa today, we're, we're, we're under pressure, we're crying at 11.75 interest, but, you know, consistently for four years in Turkey, 20 something percent interest, um, really difficult. Um, but despite those challenges, you know, the business that I went to join is thriving. Um, you know, we from my second year onwards, we were growing our customer base 50% year on year. Um, retention rate increased 300% from the time I joined and lead gen more than doubled. Um, so if they were doing a million leads 
in year one, in year two, they were doing too many leads. Um, and the big thing there was I got there, the technology wasn't up to scratch. Um, I had difficulty with the CTO then. Um, we parted ways quite quickly and I was the interim CTO for two or three months. And I was fortunate enough to meet a guy who had a startup in analytics and an analytics business. And I, you know, negotiated to buy his company, um, which then meant that, you know, it was an accu hire type of thing. So that guy ended up becoming the CTO of the business. And he had 14 techies that ended up joining us and forming the base of the company. And then I also built the product plan in terms of what we would do. And from the time we started, we with the right click new project, basically, it took nine months to build uh, pretty much what you see today if you go to the HEPCM Lock website. Um, so again, leveraging experience from Property24, knowing how the market and niche works, um, we were able to then do that uh, for the Turkish market. Um, 2022, you know, COVID hit. Uh, 2020, as you guys all don't know. 2022, I was like, I've lived through three years of this thing, far from family. I hadn't seen my wife at the time, you know. Um, she was stuck in Cape Town and I was in Turkey. We were separated for two and a half years. So I decided that I wanted to move back. Um, and in looking for what to do when to come, um, I ended up joining the Better Home Group. Uh, Better Home Group is an investor in the real estate ecosystem. I obviously know the niche quite well. And Better Home, you know, these brands and businesses you see here, except for the banks, um, are Better Home businesses, um, either fully owned or wholly or partially owned um, by Better Home. So I joined the group as head of marketplaces. Um, you know, and my aim for joining was to build this end-to-end -end transaction model where from someone looking for a home to buy rent um, or rent out or sell, all the way through to the transaction happening. Um, there's multiple touch points, 16 different touch points, and Better Home has a few businesses along the way, like agencies like Remax, you know, where you deal with the agent, or if it's a development, you deal with Red Eye. Um, and, you know, if you need a mortgage, you deal with Better Bond or Mortgage Max in partnership with those banks. And the switch, Switch X, is what does the mortgage switching. If you need data, there's Loom that will give you a, a report to say, what is this property worth? If you need insurance, there's Better Sure. You know, so that end to end transaction model is what I was focused on until recently, where, you know, it made sense for me to be more involved in the place where I have deep experience. Um, in property and private property. Um, and yeah, recently, having been supporting the business from, um, let's say, the group level, um, they decided that rather I should use the experience I have in this niche and, and run private property directly. So as of the 1st of May, which is quite recent, I became the CEO for private property. And I say that it's full circle of SA real estate because, you know, I'm now basically trying to undo what I did 10 years ago or 12 years ago with building Property24 and making it so strong. I now need to elevate private property to compete with my former self. So I call it shadow boxing. Uh, and that's what the image on the right hand side is. Um, and right now it's day one of or month one, let's say. Um, and ultimately, you know, when you wake up in the morning, this picture that you're seeing now on the right, that's the sunset look. Imagine the sun behind, you know, that guy's me standing there, right? The shadow is long and looks like a giant in front of me. And that's what I see as Property24. It's a big giant. But as the sun comes over my head midday, right? That shadow is right underneath me and I can kind of maneuver. And a year or two from now, that's the sunset. Property 24 will still be a giant, but that giant's going to be behind me. <laughs> so that's kind of my analogy around fighting my shadow. Um, and yeah, you know, you can enter a market that has got a very strong dominant player, which is what Property 24 is. Um, 
But I believe that if you do things smartly, Are you there? Yeah, it, lo it looks like we've lost Theo's connection. Um, we sh hopefully should be back just now. Um, I see everybody's enjoying okay. everything. Hopefully, you'll be back on just now. Um, let me just see quickly. While, while we wait for him, I just want to remind everybody um that we've got uh, we've got next week's session which uh in, is from bula and so you can continue to rsvp uh via the link tree uh the details are already there uh and you could look out for the the next session that's coming um i know he wanted to be quite interactive is actually we uh, hijacked him while he's uh busy preparing for uh uh, for a, an award. So again, I'm not sure if that's maybe got something to do with it, uh, but it, um, it assured me that it was going to be okay. And I'm, I'm still I'm wanting him to, to add some of his... Uh, there he's back. There you go. Uh, are you there, big guy? Yes, I am. I got kicked out. Um, I think my Thank internet back. is in the hotel. Apologies. Yeah. I think okay. the video is coming. Yeah. So please tell me when I'm back. I had I had one slide left. Yeah, can you hear us? Yes. I thought he was back for a second. Um, yeah, he's back. He's and back. again, I can hear him. Yeah, I can right. hear him. His life experience. Uh, uh, I see. He's trying to switch his camera on. We can hear him. Maybe try with the camera off. I'm not sure. Just at least we get the audio. Who oh, is back? Camera on, everything. everything. Okay, yeah, I think he's back. All I right. think Are you back saying, now? I'm back, but you can't hear me. All right. Apologies. Vu, with your permission, I can continue. Carry on. No, good. Yeah, okay. continue. All right. So as I'm, I was saying, apologies for that, guys. Um, yeah, very quickly, we've rebuilt the website, the first phase of it, uh, of private property. Um, many exciting phases coming. Uh, and it's a very exciting process for me. Um, to be able to compete in the South African market again against my former colleagues. Uh, it's a fun battle because they know our every move. Um, so we need to box very smartly. Um, they also have deeper pockets. So we have to be very clever about our marketing um, initiatives. So um, you guys, please keep an eye out for private property. Um, you know, definitely if you're looking for a home, that should be your platform of choice. Uh, check us out. Support the underdog. Amanda. <laughs> okay. So if, if I can continue. Yeah, hobbies. Um, I think this was the last thing um, before we get to the interactive phase. My hobbies have shifted through the years, you know, um, I started off with salsa dancing in the early days, and now uh, as I get older, I can't travel that much to go to these events abroad. So um, I've created, you know, I play golf these days uh, when I can spare the time. Um, and, and I'm also getting a bit into uh, music production. So that's my working from home desk over there. Um, which you can see on the right hand side with you know keyboards and drum machines and turntables on it. 
Um, I've got a vinyl collection. I sample from vinyl, and we're making we're making music, but it takes up quite a lot of time. Um, and over the last eight months, let's say, um, you know, spending two hours on a Saturday or a Sunday is what I limited to. Uh, but that definitely keeps me sane, and it 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 drives me going forward. So I think, you know, having a passion outside of technology is helpful because it fuels your brain and soul in ways that you um, you don't realize you need. Um, and it also helps you to focus uh, when you do then jump back into tech um, uh, because you have an outlet somewhere else. So I think, you know, we can do the interactive session and uh, Vu, but what I'll do is there's one slide, guys. Thank you for joining. I appreciate you taking the time to listen and being a part of the session. Darkies and Tech, uh, thank you, team, uh, for the invitation. Uh, my contact details on the last slide, just take a screenshot or, you know, uh, it's actually pretty easy to find me on LinkedIn and things like that. Inbox, if you have a technical challenge that you need assistance with, uh, very happy to, to, to help. But on the last slide, is my details plus also a snippet of one of the songs that we're busy making from the my home studio, um, which was inspired by Zex Bantwini. Hopefully the sound is shared. I don't know if I redid that on my second time sharing now, but here we go. I'll leave it for 30 seconds and then Vu can jump in. We'll, we'll use it. We'll, we'll, find, we'll find another way. So, so before before we all jump off, I wanted to quickly just ask you, Theo, um, five things for me that uh, you want founders to do when they're thinking about product, when they're thinking about scaling, when they're thinking about uh, expansion and growth, when they're thinking about building a product. Um, what five things do you do? Would you give them advice on um, to make sure that they do? Because I know. Uh, you know, um, you, you're very real about some of the stuff that guys aren't getting right. So what advice would you give them? Just five things and then we'll open up the session and stop the recording and everything. Um, look, maybe one, can I stop sharing? Uh, we think it might be easier. I want to be able to see you. So you said five things founders should look out for. Yeah, yeah. What, well, I mean, what advice would you give any 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 founder building in Africa right now, based on your experience? Like really, like hardcore advice, big brotherly advice, uh, no fluff, just straight, straight, straight advice. Okay, so firstly, you know, Africa is untapped. Um, I think that don't try to build a solution for Silicon Valley. Um, you know, that that you're trying to build for or that you want users in Africa to adopt. Forget about the, you know, fancy designs and the slick this and that. Um, build technology for the end user that you're building for. Product market fit at the end of the day, right? So um, I've seen solutions built for South Africa and for Kenya and for Tanzania and for, you know, um, Malawi, that if they were built and launched in the US, they would fly, but they struggle because those interfaces that are built, the user experience doesn't connect with the audience. Um, you know, take the time to understand what your audience want and need um, and ultimately build that and then you can launch it to them. Once you've got adoption, then you branch out. Don't try to do too much too early. You know, if you look at Property24 today, it's very, very simple. Look at private property today, very, very simple, right? Because that's what the South African end user needs and wants. We're not trying to do all the fancy, 
you know, mapping and drawing of circles and dragging this and that. It's just simple. Um, and, and, and that's the beauty of it, the simplicity of private property today. Um, so cater for your audience. Don't do too much too quickly. Um, and when something's working, don't be afraid to double down on that. Um, because yeah, sometimes you see that you want to build the next thing, you know, the next monetization module instead of just pushing the first one a lot harder marketing wise and getting more users to use it. Um, those are common mistakes and, uh, you know, we see it very often and the conversations we have, um, you know, fortunate enough to know Vu in a long time. So the kind of deep conversations we've had, um, together, um, you know, those are the things that I just try to echo here uh, because I think founders tend to um, to do too much, too much too soon. You know, rather have a simple product that caters for one little thing and does that very well and everybody loves it and uses it. Um, that's kind of the, the, the approach that I'd have for, for African founders. Great, great stuff. So I, I want to give everybody a chance to interact. And I know you still have to, uh, uh, you've got an event coming, you have to freshen up and uh, and look all still already, see already. Um, so let, let, we're going to give uh, Theo the, I uh, will give you guys the next 23 minutes for, for Q&A. So let me quickly stop the recording. Thanks to everybody who joined us online. Um, really remember to join us again next week. We've got the uh, amazing team uh, from Vula joining us from London uh, in the UK uh, next week. Um, check out what they'll be doing. And again, they'll be unpacking. They found a journey, um, talking through some of their challenges, as well as uh, doing a product demo uh, um, for, for you guys. And again, I'm sure you've heard one or two things about the Vula platform. I see it gets mentioned quite a few times on the Darkies in Tech uh, um, community channel. So yeah. you get to interact with them and get to basically see what they're doing and building out of the UK into the rest of the continent, Africa, and the journey that they're going um, in doing so. So thanks to everybody online. Thanks to everybody who's watching this um, the recording, and hopefully you found the session um, useful. For everybody else, we want to encourage you to stay on the call, on the Zoom, and then you, you, um, you'll uh, be able to, uh, to address some of your questions and some of the interactions to Thea. We'll try and go back to the chat as, as far as we can. So thanks to everybody um, on the YouTube and um, 